All right. Welcome, everyone, um, to our community conversation, August 23rd, on the Clean Water Act and um, finfish farming. Matt Cannon, he, him, I'm with the main chapter of the Sierra Club. I'm the state conservation and energy director, and we greatly appreciate you joining us tonight. I'm going to introduce Jim Merkel, um, who will introduce the speakers, and then we'll get going. Thank you all for joining us. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to see all of you joining us for the this uh, great event. I'm really excited for it. Um, the Maine Sierra Club has been in a bit of a quandary trying to understand how we can keep our waters clean in the coast of Maine. So with five big facilities, industrial facilities wanting to locate in Maine, if you add up the nitrogen output from all of them, you would look at 19 Portland city sewers of nitrogen going into Maine's waters. And it seems like they're getting permitted. That's a sewer for 60,000 people each. And, you know, there's no real look at the, um, the cumulative impacts. And even, you know, when I was talking to Dave Losey and other attorneys in Maine and asking how are these things getting permitted? Do we need new laws? And he says, no, we have to reinforce the laws we have. And that's what led to this event. Dave says, we, we just got to enforce the laws we have because right now they're not being enforced. And um, it's really a dire situation for the Maine, which is our brand and, and everything about what we love and what Sierra Club is about is to protect the beautiful shoreline and the whole state. But um, the shore is really, I think, threatened by these industrial facilities. So I'm gonna, I'm really excited. I learned tonight that Charles and David are have have a history and you know grew up I mean worked together for some years and their kids know each other so I'll, I'll introduce them both but Dave Losey he began his legal career in 1971 a year after the Congress created the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency and just a year before the Clean Water Act passed and in, then he was a special counsel to Connecticut's uh, legislature's environmental committee and then he drafted some of the first environmental statutes there to help the state be compliant with the federal Clean Water Act. And then in 20, 2004, he was appointed to an eight year term on the US Environmental Health Sciences Council. And there he worked uh, on the potential for and prevention of bioterror and chemical warfare attacks following 9-11. And also he worked in to look at possible environmental causes of breast cancer and other illnesses. And then David retired and humorously unretired as can happen here in the central coast. And, uh, but he does limit his practice to environmental compliance issues. And now he serves as a lead counsel to Upstream Watch, a very fantastic uh, nonprofit that's out of Belfast, but they work in the mid coast seeking restoration of rivers in the upper mid coast region. And Dave also recently participated in Upstream's challenge to the application of Nordic Aquafarms to build a $500 million fish factory in Belfast and Northport. And I might as well just go ahead and introduce Charlie at the same time. And Charlie, after um, his undergrad at Harvard, he studied in Maine at University of Maine Law School, graduating in 79, and then clerked for three Maine justices working his way from the north in Halton down to Bangor and then to Portland, a steady south southern trajectory. And then in 1980, Charles took a job at the uh, EPA's regional office in Boston, where he worked mainly on Clean Water Act enforcement and also Superfund law, including the cleanup of New Bedford Harbor and the related litigation. And in 1990, he took a job as a lawyer for the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority a new agency created for the cleanup of uh, Boston Harbor. And there his work included enforcement of discharge permits issued to industrial dischargers. He retired in uh, 2019. And now since retirement, he and his wife, Marilyn, have been building a house in Owlsboro where they've you know, had a lifelong connection. And he still is licensed to practice law. And he's been also assisting Upstream Watch in its appeal of Nordic Aquaculture's permits since they were issued in uh, 2019. So um, I'm really excited to have both of you with us. And um, Dave, I think you'll kick it off, right? 
<clears throat> Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Excuse me. And good evening, everyone. And thank you for allowing me to join you this afternoon or this evening. A few months ago, Jim asked me what legislation I thought the Sierra Club might want to propose to the next session of the legislature. He asked me that in the context of my having represented Upstream Watch in the Nordic Aquafarm application. And I, I note that David Noyes from Nordic is here. Welcome, David. Um, I told him I thought no new laws were necessary. Politicians want to take credit for doing something, with all due respect, Jan. So they pass laws whether we need them or not. In my opinion, Maine's environmental laws are just fine. They're improperly implemented. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. That's where we need help. Honoring the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act, I'll use that act um, as an example. And where uh, some factual uh, examples are needed, I may use the Nordic Aquafarms application, but this is not about Nordic. This is about the Clean Water Act. That act was proposed and debated and passed as I went from a second year law student to becoming a lawyer, being sworn in in 1971. I remember the chief sponsor of that Clean Water Act was Senator Muskie from the great state of Maine. When EPA first opened its doors in 1970, its authority to enforce uh, pollution laws was very weak. They didn't have the power to write effluent guidelines, had only general authority to require secondary treatment. However, in the summer of 1969, sparks from a passing train showered down on the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio. The river caught on fire and it burned. And that was the ninth time that river caught on fire. It was so frequent that locals hardly took the time to notice. They simply put out the blaze and went about their business. But the publicity from that ninth event <clears throat> finally drew the public eye to the issue. President Nixon mentioned it in his State of the Union address when he asked for a Clean Water Act. Federal lawmakers took action by passing the Clean Water Act, both parties. I know we don't believe that happens anymore. It did. It did. Today, the Clean Water Act protects the quality of America's water through direct regulation of water pollutants and their points of origin. The Clean Water Act was passed at a time when about 60% of America's waterways were not fishable or swimmable, 60%. Today, in part because of the Clean Water Act, less than 40% of our waters are not fishable or swimmable, representing 20, 25% improvement. It's good, but not good enough. Well, what did the Clean Water Act do? It established a basic structure for regulating pollutant discharges into the waters of the United States. It gave the EPA the authority, which it hadn't previously uh, had, to implement pollution control programs, such as setting wastewater standards for industry. It funded the construction of sewer treatment plants under a construction grants program. It recognized the important need to address non-point source pollution. That is pollution which gets into the waterways from our fields, from our lawns, not from the, from the end of a pipe. But most important, most important, it made it unlawful for any person to discharge any pollutant from a point source into the navigable waters of the United States, unless a permit had been obtained under the provisions of the Clean Water Act. There's a process for doing that called the NPDES or National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. Let's look at the name of that permitting authority. National, all over the US, nobody's exempt. Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. It's a system to eliminate discharges of pollutants. That's the system under which you get a permit. A system gives you a permit 
the goal of which is to eliminate pollutant discharges, the very things you're getting a permit for. It was a bold, bold statement by Congress. Well, the goal of the Clean Water Act was to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. They set two interim goals. The first was to achieve the swimmable, fishable standard by 1983. Didn't make it. The second was to eliminate all discharges of pollutants into the navigable waters by 1985. Didn't make that either. But those goals of the Clean Water Act are still the goals of the Clean Water Act. And it's what we strive for today, fishable and swimmable, and in eliminate all discharges of pollutants into the waters of the United States. Well, it was passed by Congress, but it's implemented by the states primarily. The states were commanded to create water quality standards, which is like a roadmap for achieving the goals of the Clean Water Act within each state. Each state had to designate the uses of each water body in the state, establish numeric, biological, and narrative criteria to protect those uses, and keep the already good water quality uh, from being denigrated. An example of this is that the Upper Penobscot Bay, where the Nordic discharge would take place, is classified as SB, which is the second highest standard. Pretty good, considering once upon a time there was chicken waste from Belfast coming out into the bay, and it was an awful mess. It's now the second highest quality. We're not sure if they could actually ever achieve anything any higher, but it's something to be proud of, and it's something to be protected. Well, the idea of the permitting process, the NPDES permitting process, was to delegate that to the states. The EPA wanted the states to take that over. Well, the state had to qualify to take that over. Qualification required a letter from the governor requesting it, a memorandum of agreement between the state and EPA, a description of the program and how it's actually gonna work within that state, and a statement of authority by the attorney general and an examination of the underlying state laws and regulations. And they've got to be consistent with federal law and consistent with the Clean Water Act in 1973, that's what I had to do for the Connecticut legislature, to take all the Connecticut water laws and try and retool them to work under the Federal Clean Water Act. Connecticut had a goal of becoming the first industrialized state in the union to receive delegation of permitting authority from EPA, and they made it. Well, once EPA, and, and let me just ask something else, which I, I'm curious about. Maine got its authority in 2001, 30 years after the act was passed and it became available. Why did it take 30 years? I don't know the answer, but I asked the question. It took Connecticut four months. I was there, I saw it. Why 30 years? In any event, once EPA approves the program, the state assumes the permitting authority. And instead of everybody in Maine having to go to Boston for a permit, we can go to Augusta. And it has to be consistent with federal and state law. But when a state says, well, we interpret that law differently, we're gonna do it our own way. Now we got a problem. And this is what I meant when I said, you have gotta obey the law as written. Let me give you an example of two things that I've encountered with the Maine DEP that I think subvert the congressional intent. The first I call permit deferral. Let's assume a permit requires the disclosure of nine things, nine things the applicant's gotta show in order to get a permit. Well, the applicant may be only able to accomplish six, and they may say to the state, gee, I'd like to do this, but I can only do six of the nine. A favored applicant may very well be told, do six of the nine, tell you what we'll do with the other three. We'll ignore them for now, and when we give you a permit, 
will make it a condition of the permit that you do the other three. Well, what does that do? What that does is it takes three of the nine requirements out of the hearing process, gone, poof. They don't show up again until after the permit is awarded and lo and behold, there's a condition saying that the applicant has to do what they were supposed to have done before they filed the application. That's clever trick number one. It takes the issues off the table, it takes them out of the hearing process, and in my opinion, it denies you and me and our towns due process of law because we cannot address those issues in the hearing if the issues aren't in the hearing. The second technique is what I call issue avoidance, and it's similar. At the beginning of a process, the Board of Environmental Protection, which serves as a hearing adjudicator uh, for DEP, will say, gee, we're going to have a hearing. What will the topics be in our hearing? And people like me would say, the application itself, all the requirements. All they said, that can't happen. It'll be too much. We can't give you two weeks of our lives. We're all volunteers here. So we've got to narrow this down. Everybody come up with a list. So you come up with a list. And the department then determines what they're going to, what's going to survive and actually go to hearing. Do you know what they took off the list that I requested? Carbon imprint or carbon footprint, the carbon impact of this project, the climate change impact of this project. Oh no, not fit subjects for a hearing. Other questions were put by the wayside as well. For example, where does the waste go when it comes out of the pipe? The project in the Nordic case, just as an example, 7.7 .7 million gallons per day at full build of treated fish waste. Where is it going to go? They were asked the question, Upstream Watch put on testimony by a professor from the University of Maine with 37 years experience studying the Gulf of Maine, where the currents go and what have you, got ignored, got ignored. Instead, a permit condition, listen to this carefully, within two years of achieving full production, the applicant is to begin a study to determine where the waste goes. Within two years of full production. How about the years that don't make full production? How about the years that are doing 60, 70, 80%, 90% ramping up? All those years, don't know where it's going. And then while they do the study, don't know where it's going. And what happens when the study is complete? Well, the permit condition doesn't say. Permit avoidance or permit uh, uh, deferral, it's a problem. Another question that was asked but not answered, what's in the fish food that constitutes a majority of the waste? The DEP was told, well, we don't know because we're going to make a determination of what fish we're going to eat, fish food we're going to use when we get closer to the need. So we're looking at a waste, which is primarily fish waste. How is it fish waste? Because the fish poop and the fish urine is fish waste, is, is, is food, is waste from the fish food. The stuff that falls to the bottom of the tank, that's fish food waste. And we don't know what's in it. And yet they granted the permits. What about the power to run the plant? They're asked, never disclosed how much power was necessary to run the plant. All they knew was that there was 14 megawatts that was going to be produced on site to take care of outages. Well, that's great. That's a nice big number. But 14 megawatts, if they only need 10 to run the plant, is great. What about if they need 28 or 30? Then you only have half power if there's an outage. And lo and behold, after the hearings, when the applicant had not disclosed this stuff, we find out that from the Public Utilities Commission, that's about what it, what it is. They're going to have about 50% of what they need. So they're also asked, 
what is the plan? I hadn't seen the plan yet. If this were an EPA administered program, not a state administered program, I don't believe this would happen. And I'm, you know, we'll get our day in court on the specific things and, and lots of others that, that uh, specific examples. I'm using these examples not to, to argue the Nordic case here, but to say, look, these issues shouldn't be issues at this point if DEP were doing its job. Let me also talk about what I call the funnel. This goes back to the NPDES permit process. I call it a funnel because permit applications uh, must meet certain technological standards and water quality standards, and Charlie will talk more about those. And they have to be based on the best practical treatment, and they're limited to five years. So at the end of five years, you got to go back and get a renewal permit. When you get a renewal permit, you got to show that now, five years later, you're still using the best practical treatment. And so you have to improve along with the industry. You have to improve with the technology or you don't get your permit renewed. At least that's the federal law. It draws all permit holders inexorably closer to the zero discharge goal of Congress back in 1972. So that's where the, that's how the act is supposed to work. It's one man's view about why it doesn't work in Maine. And I will make a suggestion, Jim, I lied to you. I do have a, a proposal. Look at Connecticut General Statutes, section 22A-14 through 17. Here's what that says. It says that any person, corporation, firm, nonprofit, entity of any sort can bring a lawsuit against any other person, corporation, municipality, nonprofit, the state, entity of any sort for declaratory or injunctive relief. You can get an injunction where you can show that the proposed activity was reasonably likely to cause unreasonable pollution to a natural resource of the state. Let me say it again, reasonably likely, not, oh, it might happen, reasonably likely to cause unreasonable pollution, not just a drop, unreasonable pollution to a natural resource of the state, any of the state's natural resources. And once you make a prima facie case that that is so, the defendant assumes the burden and has to prove he's not doing it. And it doesn't matter if the defendant has been issued a permit by DEP. I had a conversation with Governor Thomas Meskel in 1973. He'd been the mayor of a urban of a industrial city in Connecticut. He'd been a US congressman, and then he was sitting as governor. And I said, Governor, is, I'm somewhat skeptical about the need for this, this law that allows people to bring these lawsuits. And he said, I've been in municipal government, I've been in the federal government, I've been in state government. Trust the people because you can't trust the government. He believed firmly that the people, given a chance, will do the right thing. I don't, I think laws, Maine, Maine's laws are fine. Maine has to administer and enforce them as they are written. And as a check on that, I, I urge Jan, any others who are interested in legislation, take a look at the People's Initiative in Connecticut and see if that wouldn't be a good backstop because you know what it does? It keeps DEP honest. It keeps everybody in Augusta honest. I've rambled on long enough. You can hear from a scholar now, uh, Charlie Baring. He's, uh, I think, better equipped to explain the, the true ins and outs and creation of the Clean Water Act than I. I'm kind of the shirt sleeve street fighter that uh, represented businesses over the last 50 years. Uh, Charlie? Thank you, David. Uh, I'm not at all sure I'm better at explaining anything than you are, but I'll give my, give it my best shot. Uh, and I want to begin with something that I put into our appeal brief. It's a quote from the late Justice Scalia. It's a very simple statement. The words of a statute mean what they say. <laughs> and 
Scalia made that statement, actually he said it in a case, which I can't remember the name of, but he made he wrote in a, in a text that he wrote about interpreting laws that um, he distinguished, and this is what he is most known for, he distinguished between original intent and original meaning. And he was opposed to the search for the original tent, intent, except to the extent that it could be uh, discerned from the meaning. And he emphasized the meaning of the words. And in the context of the Clean Water Act, the uh, one thing things Scalia said is that if the intent, if in, if their statute contains a statement of intent, that's part of the law, and it has just as much force as the rest of the law. In the context of the Clean Water Act, we have Section 101, which is a section that says that the purpose of the law is fishable, swimmable water, and the goal of the law is fishable, swimmable, swimmable water, and uh, the elimination of discharge of pollutants to the waters of the United States. And I want to make a quick distinction here. That means to the waters of the United States. If you have wastewater that has some pollutants in it and you reuse it in some fashion and don't discharge it, you are not discharging in violation of the Clean Water Act. Uh, and if you discharge clean water after removing the pollutants, that's also not a violation, uh, at least not uh, as a general matter, there may be contexts in which there's a reason why it might be, but uh, in general, the act, the intent of the act to achieve zero discharge is just as much in force now as it ever was. And the words mean what they say. Uh, now, in you know, I want to talk about the, the effluent standards, as they're called, or the, or the standards governing discharges from a facility when it applies for a permit. There are two kinds of discharge limits that the Clean Water Act calls for, and it's, it's a stepwise process. Either the permit contains technology-based standards, or if those are insufficient to prevent the degradation of water quality in the receiving water, then the permit has to have water quality-based limits, right? So you may use the word standards and uh, it's specifically limits in the context of, of the permit. It's limits on the concentrations of pollutants in the discharge. They, those limits can be based on standards in the act, but uh, the permit limit is what governs the discharge itself. Now, when uh, DEP issued the permit to Nordic. They went through a long, in their, in their final decision uh, in November of 2019, they described at length Nordic's di proposed discharge system. And they never actually said, at least I don't remember them saying that this represented the best available technology or the best technology in use uh, and they also did not base the limits on what that discharge technology could achieve. Nordic proposed this system and proposed a limit of 23 milligrams per liter for dissolved nitrogen. And dissolved nitrogen is the pollutant of concern to us here. And I'll get, get to that in a minute. Uh, but I want to say that DEP consider the fate of uh, nitrogen in the receiving waters. They, they spent a great deal of time modeling it and reviewing the models. And they determined that uh, 23 milligrams per liter was too high. And they did what the statute called on them to do. They came up with a water quality based limit of 21 milligrams per liter which is only 3% less than 23, but it turns out that it is a significant difference. And uh, there is nothing in the record which shows, tells us how, or tell DEP how Nordic can meet that limit. So DEP ended up finding that this discharge as it would be, as the, the applicants said it would be from their system would cause 
uh, deleterious, and that's not that's the word they use, but I'm trying to use a non-technical term. It would harm water quality. And the uh, limit that DEP chose was not, according to the record, something that DEP had any evidence that the company could meet. Now, I read that to mean that when the permit is issued, the company can begin, can build its system as it was designed, as it was described in the uh, final decision issuing the permit, and begin discharging as soon as they have production up and running. And to me, they're not going to meet the water quality based limit under those circumstances. So there will be the kind of harm to water quality which DEP predicted. And that leaves me wondering how DEP could possibly have made the determination that water quality wouldn't be harmed. Now I know what they said. They said it's not, they won't be harmed because the permit has a limit of 21 milligrams per liter and that will protect the water. Now that we also have in Maine something called the uh, the site law, the site the law for protecting sites uh, when uh, they're chosen, and I forget the exact terms of this, the formal name of it, but the site law requires a determination from DP that there will be no adverse effects to, and they it covers air quality and water quality and a lot of other interests. I don't understand how DP could in one breath say they can't meet this discharge. They, we have no evidence that they can meet this limit. And if they discharge at a higher amount, higher concentration, there will be harm to water quality. And then make a finding as required by the site law that there won't be harm to water quality. And it's a curious fact that in the site law decision that the EP issued, they don't make that finding. What they do instead is try to incorporate by reference the, the water discharge permit, which also doesn't make that finding. And in fact, tells us that there will be water quality harm. Uh, and uh, so I am very much at a loss as to how this permit uh, will be upheld when we finally get a decision from the uh, what we call the law court, the main SJC. We are we have a brief in front of them, and we're waiting for a response from the state. Uh, two responses: one from the state, one from Nordic. We will have an opportunity to respond to those responses, and then the SJC will grant oral argument, schedule it sometime after those things are filed, and sometime after that they'll issue a decision. I have no idea how long that process will last, uh, but. Um, when I clerked for the SJC, Vincent McCusick was the chief justice and he was determined to reduce the backlog. And we did it. We got the backlog down to a couple of months. As I recall, it may have been more than that, but it was not a year more than a year. And it had been up to three years at times. So I will be confident when we get a decision that when, when, when we have oral argument that we will have a wait of only a few months before we get a decision. So sometime this winter, um, and and we'll see what they do with it. Uh, now, uh, I also want to talk about uh, how technology-based standards are arrived at and uh, what what they look like. Uh, there are several different terms in both Maine's and uh, EPA's or the federal statute that describe various levels of water quality or, or technology-based standards. Because of the amount of time that's gone by, the only ones that really matter now are best available technology and new source performance standards, which are for facilities that are, have never been built or just discharges that have never been operated before. Uh, now there is there is a different standard which is for, and I'll, I'll explain this, that their best available technology is now the standard for toxic pollutants. And there are a large number of toxic pollutants. I believe it's 130 now. And uh, those pollutants are addressed 
whenever EPA develops a categorical standard that discharges any of them. Here, we're concerned with nitrogen. There are other pollutants in uh, Nordic's proposed discharge, and some of those uh, will be eliminated by Nordic's treatment system. Uh, and, but most of them are in fact, and as is nitrogen, they're actually uh, nutrients and therefore not toxic pollutants. However, this is a facility that is brand new on a site that has nothing, never had anything built on it. It is quintessentially a new source and it should be subject to a new source performance standard. Uh, and that's the argument, one of the arguments we make in our appeal. In this permit, DEP did not do that. It didn't even talk about new source performance standards, as I recall. Maybe I missed something. But the standard that they set is something, as I just mentioned, that the technology that will be put in use under this permit can't meet. Now, uh, the way that you identify a technology based standard is. You look at existing, you consider, and that's the word in the statute, existing technology. Uh, and even if that word weren't there in their statute, the idea that this uh, technology has to be the best te technology necessarily implies that there will be some comparison between the proposed technology and other technology and uses or treatment technology and uses at other facilities. Uh, and we, uh, Upstream Watch, recommended uh, other facilities that DEP should look at. That was filed right at the beginning of the permitting process in December of 2019, uh, I believe. Uh, or right, excuse me, uh, December of 2018. It was before the, the permitting hearings began and not after the permit was issued. The recommendation made by upstream in those that was what's called pre-filed testimony it was to qualify expert witnesses to testify epa uh, upstream made the same recommendation repeatedly in comments on draft permits in a brief that they filed after the completion of the hearing and uh, again uh, in uh, the fall of 2019 uh, in, in comments on the draft water permit. The recommendation was that, EPA, that DEP should consider three companies that are all achieving, uh, are working to achieve, but in fact, we're achieving uh, zero discharge. And those companies were a company called Aquamultmuth. I don't know if I have the pronunciation right. It's an Israeli company that, as I understand it, was building new companies in Canada and even in, uh, in the West, in Nevada, I believe, and working very hard to improve its technology all the time. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with their doing that. That's what you would expect them to do. But the fact is that they were in their operating facilities, uh, they were achieving a discharge that doesn't uh, discharge pollutants to fresh water. Now, I'm saying that out of memory and I, uh, it's possible I have Aquamove wrong, but I know that the other two companies, Superior Fresh, which is a Midwestern company that discharges treated wastewater uh, as a, an irrigation uh, source. And that does not go, the pollutants in that discharge do not go to the waters of the United States. And the other company is the best of them, say Sustainable Blue, which is located in Nova Scotia. And uh, upstream supporters have been there. Uh, we have, uh, our expert witness has talked to their manager. They have said, and we put this in the record of DEP's hearing, that they could put their technology to use on at the scale of the facility that Nordic has proposed and achieve zero discharge. And that's in the record. And it's the only thing on the record that is on the subject of zero discharge because DEP never responded to any of the comments submitted by upstream. And that is a violation on their part of a requirement that is in EPA's regulations and is identically 
in DEP's regulations. The exception in that requirement is that they're not required to respond to ins insignificant, they're only, they are required to respond to significant comments. And it is entirely beyond my understanding how they could have claimed or thought that these comments about discharge technology from upstream were insignificant. I don't believe they actually really thought that, but I don't know what they did and I don't know why they did it. The only thing I know is there's nothing in the record in the nature of any response to those comments. Um, so uh, we end up with uh, a record that shows the DEP did not consider other technologies in spite of what the statute says they should have done. Uh, and they really didn't have a basis uh, of any kind for choosing a uh, technology-based standard. The uh, outcome was that they didn't choose a technology-based standard at all, but they did leave that uh, extensive description of the proposed system in the permit. And it, the implication is that that's what the permit allows Nordic to build. I don't know what would happen. What, I don't know what DEP would do if Nordic built something completely different from what the permit describes. Uh, I think they might say, all we can enforce in this permit is the 21 milligram per liter water quality based permit limit. If you can do that, you're okay. Uh, and I have no idea how they would do that because they never offered us anything. Uh, it doesn't mean they couldn't, couldn't do it. It just means we haven't seen any plan to do it. Um, now, the one thing I wanna conclude in that discussion is that the, there have been a number of circuit court cases concerning zero discharge as a, either a requirement in state regulations that are being reviewed by these circuit courts or in some cases uh, as a requirement uh, that has been imposed on a given industry. And we cited a number of these cases in our brief and I just wanna quote one of them, which described the zero discharge goal as the guiding star of the Clean Water Act. It should have been a moment of, I don't know, celebration uh, when the comment identifying a company that had achieved zero discharge was received. But I don't know what the DP actually thought. Um, and uh, I, all I know is they didn't do anything about that comment. Uh, so I, now I wanna add that as we, as it's our information that there are three and there were four new NPDES permits for agriculture facilities under consideration. And anyone can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that the, there was one permit proposal that was denied, and I don't think it was by DEP. So I don't know whether the DEP still has four or five, but there are a lot of proposals in the works uh, coming down the pike. And I would expect that upstream, I mean, Nordic's permit would be treated as a model for those uh, new applications. And I would expect to see if that happens, that they would have the same findings about the alleged best available technology. And I don't know how they're gonna justify that because DEP has already said that that would lead to water quality violations. I, I really don't know how those new permits are gonna work. And I think it will take some serious revision of thinking. Now, I, when I was thinking about all of this uh, and trying to uh, think through, I know David and I agreed that we didn't wanna talk about how the laws could be changed. Uh, I have a couple of uh, ideas about that and recommendations, which I'd like to offer. One is that EPA has, under the Clean Water Act, an obligation to regularly review and, if necessary, revise its existing federal categorical standards. It's under Section 304M of the Act, and they have uh, a schedule that 
or at least they have a schedule and a plan that identifies several industries that they will uh, review, one of which is agriculture. And that's because in 2004, EPA issued agriculture uh, regulations, federal categorical regulations, which contained no discharge limits. It, they only, uh, the only standards they created were what's called best management practices. Now, that may have been the state of the knowledge of the industry in 2004, but that was almost 20 years ago. And what we know now tells us it is high time for them to revisit those regulations. Uh, and I would suggest as a possible ad goal of advocacy that we either get EPA to do that or we get Congress to tell them to do it. And Congress could, in fact, tell them to do a review of those uh, of agriculture in light of the goals of the Clean Water Act, implying that if they find that zero, dis technology, zero discharge technology is in use and could be used, that should be the best available technology. Uh, and that would be the, the federal term under the main statute, it would be the best practical treatment. But that's the, that's the standard that I would envision and hope to see for the future of aquaculture in, on the coast of Maine. And I wanna emphasize, that's what I, Upstream and its members are advocating. It, it, this is not a method, an attempt to stop aquaculture from being developed. It's not even a, an attempt to stop uh, Nordic from being built. And I think that has always been clear. <clears throat> Nordic has, I mean, Upstream has always said that, and I hope that it, the word gets around that that's what this is about, because this is not, and I hope nobody would ever use in reference to what we're doing, the phrase NIMBY. That's not what this is, what we're doing. Um, so, so in conclusion, I have those recommendations and I, uh, well, I, I want to add uh, that one other thing that could be done in terms of an amendment to Maine statute, the Maine legislature could do this. There should be a rule prohibiting DEP from issuing a water quality based standard in an NPDES permit without a record showing how the company would meet that standard, meet that limit. And uh, the uh, there should be a compliance schedule in the permit, which requires them to achieve compliance with that limit within a reasonable amount of time. And the technology should have been shown to uh, the agency. It should be in the record of the permit when it's issued. And there should never be another permit that has a water quality based limit with no evidence that it can be met. And so I'm going to conclude there and thank you very much for, for listening. And thanks, I want to thank the Sierra Club too for giving us this opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Charlie and Dave. Really, really appreciate all of that. Um, and as we said, folks, we have a little bit of time for Q&A. We have a big, pretty big chunk of folks on the call. So we're going to keep it to the chat function um, and we'll do our best to get to where we get um, by the hour and anything else we'll, we'll try to follow up with folks on. Uh, but if you do have extra questions that we don't get to, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'll put my email in the chat <clears throat> later. But uh, I'll leave it to Jim and I will try to facilitate and field some of these questions from the chat. Um, so Jim, I don't know if you want to start off and see. Matt, Matt, yeah, Matt, oh yeah, Dave, go ahead. Sure. Up. I want to underscore Charlie's point that Upstream Watch is not anti-aquaculture. Upstream Watch is not anti-Nordic. Upstream Watch is pro doing it right. It's an important point that I know that all the directors at Upstream would want me to make. And thank you for that opportunity, Matt. Of course, yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Great. Well, anybody who has a question, please do put it in the chat. And I see we have a few there. So 
Um, if anyone else wants to write a question in the chat, and now's your time to do it. And, um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So um, just want to take it, uh, really take advantage of the expertise that we have here on the call. And uh, we have from Don asking, um, he's just saying it should be mentioned that Cook Aquaculture has been operating at a multitude of industrial open pen salmon farms in Maine's waters for over 20 years with DMR and the DEP turning a blind eye to the pollution and environmental impact of their operations. And so I wonder if you, Charlie or Dave, have any thoughts about, I mean, some of these new proposals coming through are um, land-based systems, so-called recirculating, but they are what are known also as open recirculating, not closed. So they have a, they recirculate, but then they put out mat, usually millions of gallons of water per day. But these other net pens, of course, are just the pollution is going straight, straight, straight into the um, in, environment. And do, do either of you, Dave or Charles, have a good idea of like how these have been permitted? Because they do seem to be really impactful. I don't know what the history is, but I certainly agree that they should be, uh, the permits that they have should be revised, uh, revoked, whatever, whatever the best outcome would be. It would take a lot of process for the state to do that, but I think they should undertake it. And I believe, I don't know what you could get the legislature to do, but that is a good point of advocacy. Yeah. And yeah. uh, Jim, I see one more above. Um, David, just, yeah, just about the zero discharge um, in municipalities. I think you both said that the technology exists, but can you speak more to um, the technology and how zero discharge would be applied to all municipalities? I said it exists at an agriculture facility uh, or three different agriculture facilities, but particularly uh, Sustainable Blue in Nova Scotia. I said nothing about municipalities and in fact, Municipalities are regulated quite differently from industrial discharges under the Clean Water Act uh, because there is a specific technology uh, which is in use and there are three levels of uh, discharge. I, I work for a, a municipal uh, discharger in Boston and it is a, a huge facility. It's very expensive to operate and zero discharge would not be reasonable, but for industries that discharge into the sewer system, zero discharge would be, in some cases, quite possible. And I believe, as I recall, that there were people doing it. I know that there were quite a number of dischargers of mercury who simply stopped doing what they were doing that, that caused those discharges. So that's, that's not quite the same thing as what I'm talking about, because I'm talking about a company with a treatment system that is treating wastewater taken out of their RAS or recirculating system and treating it to remove all the pollutants. And I think the important point is they can do it. And in EPA's history, in EPA's case law, there are situations in which EPA has based a, a standard, a zero discharge standard on a, or a BAT, best available technology standard on a single facility and imply, imposed it on a whole category of industries, uh, of companies. And the circuit court has upheld their doing that and said that if that's what has happened, one company has gotten out in front of everybody else, the way the statute works is that should be BAT. And EPA has done it exactly right. Yeah. And um, I see in the chat, there's a question about, um, a, a statement that they are the same technologies. Why is it reasonable for a city, but not a, a um, aquaculture facility? He says a farm. Um, it, um, and then someone at MS uh, responded, none of the proposed projects in Maine are discharging into a sewer. Um, could you, David or Charles, comment on those two comments and maybe uh, your thoughts between those two? I'm not seeing the comments, but it's not the same okay. technology. I mean, it's different. That technology could be 
replicated or other technologies could achieve the same thing. And it's, it's simply not the same if you're talking about other industries or sewage treatment plants. Okay. And um, let's see that I had a question for you two also, and I'll see, um, I'm kind of monitoring, monitoring the chat as we go. Go for uh, it, Jim. But also I'm wondering in the, in the case of the uh, project up in Jonesport, the Kingfish project, it seemed they, that the, their nitrogen levels are five times that of Nordics actually per quantity of fish. It's a very, very high nitrogen outputting facility. Um, it's about the same output of nitrogen, like twice Portland sewer, but um, for fifth of, of the fish. But they have an exemption for economic necessity. And I thought that may have been an, a main part of the law. Is that in the federal law? An exemption, if you can, so the city, um, I mean, the uh, DEP is basically saying, um, we're giving you an exemption because we think you're in, in extraordinarily economically under um, a tough situation as a town of Jonesport that you can be excused from the law because you have an economic necessity. Is that Maine's interpretation or is that federal law? That is actually an express provision in Maine's regulations. And I don't know of anything in federal law which is equivalent. Uh, there are ways that the feds could uh, work a concept like that into their idea of best technology, uh, but where you have an existing standard or limit, I don't believe there is such an exemption. Um, and so, uh, and I, I think in King, the case of Kingfish, I mean, that was, that, that is the, what DEP is allowed to do, but it hasn't been built yet. And I, I guess it has been approved by the local community, but I, I was under the impression that uh, there's still more to come on that. Right, it's not approved by the community, but they had a referendum that didn't pass, but it's also go through the planning board and meet local. No. Uh, yeah. Um, and MS is asking if zero discharge are possible, wouldn't that mean none of these permit, permit none of these uh, facilities would even need a discharge permit? And then wouldn't they wanna actually do that? Wouldn't it be in their best interest to actually propose something very, very clean for Maine and not propose all this nitrogen pollution. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I agree with that. I, it used to be a big issue uh, at when I was at MWRA, whether somebody who was connected to the system but wasn't discharging and had no plans to discharge needed a permit. EPA at one time took the position that yes, they should have a permit and yes, they should report annually or biannually uh, to confirm that they're not discharged. I didn't really think we even had jurisdiction to enforce that, but uh, uh, it may be that if there is a discharge of clean water, uh, which there usually will be at these facilities because it, they'll have a sanitary discharge, that it might be uh, that the agency might decide that they want some kind of annual review or annual confirmation that they're not discharging uh, from their sewage treatment, from their uh, uh, RAS system. But it's true that if there was really no discharge, then there wouldn't be anything to permit. And uh, so, yeah, they should want that. Yeah. And um, Jan is also, uh, Jan Dodge has put in, in just wondering if there, if either of you have seen anything on the horizon with um, say aquaculture programs at our universities. And, um, you know, I'm really curious too, just what researches um, you might've discovered for, you know, these facilities to really uh, push toward and, and start to propose those in Maine, those zero effluent facilities. Well, I, I can uh, take a, a shot at that. I am not familiar with the programs in Maine, I confess that. Uh, but I did do a, a, a environmental compliance program partnering with EPA at about 400 colleges and universities around the country. And I observed in a number of places, Florida Institute of Technology, for example, is one uh, where they're doing remarkable work 
uh, on exactly that subject. I think that we're going to see some terrific advances uh, championed by our young people. I hope that it's happening in Maine the way it is in other states. Maine did not participate in the college audit program uh, when we did it. Uh, it was one of the, uh, most of the states did. But so I had a chance to see the other states, but not Maine. And uh, golly, if Maine's anything like what we were seeing in some of these other states, uh, the future is very bright. Uh -huh. If you do a search on aquaculture in Maine, you'll discover that there is lots and lots of research and programs and uh, state and university and college. I went through a lot of those websites and I did not see anything about wastewater discharges, which doesn't mean they're not doing it, but I just didn't find it. Work with me, Charlie. I'll show you. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, well, we're at the we're at the hour, folks. Um, I know there's maybe a couple lingering questions. Um, if there are any more, please feel free to reach out. But I just want to respect the speaker's time and um, try to keep these to an hour. So I don't know if the speakers have any final thoughts. Really appreciate you giving us some ideas on legislation. Um, but are there any final thoughts before we wrap up here? Um, it, just this, that I, I appreciate the Sierra Club's effort to pull this together. 50 years under the Clean Water Act. I remember watching President Nixon advocating that in a State of Union address and thinking 50 years from now, I'm not going to be alive 50 years from now. Well, here I am and here we are. And the act is alive and well and getting better all the time. And, and good faith efforts on the part of our environmental administrators can make a better world for all of us. And I look forward to cooperating in that adventure. I'd much rather be doing that in my non-retirement than taking an opposition position. Uh, you know, I, I really did come to Maine to retire. A lot of people do. I think they're smart. I wasn't smart enough to, to sustain it. Um, but I, I think that the that um, uh, that's the future uh, and, uh, and not uh, not antagonism. I think there's a lot that can be done that's positive. I just want to extend my thanks to Jim and Matt and the Sierra Club. Uh, this has been terrific. And I uh, second everything David just said. So thank you. And uh, we'll look forward. If you want to email me more questions, I'll take a shot at answering them. Yeah. Great. Thank you both very much for your time. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, really appreciate it. We'll post the recording online and hope that you um, stay in touch with us on our future endeavors. Have a great rest of your day.